top three holy places in the world. Here, What's at Suel, Yushalayim. More specific. The Kosel. Okay, where else? Um, Lakewood. <laughs> Lakewood, you're at Kodesh. Yeah. Okay, good. And I would say my city, St. Louis. St. Louis, Missouri. That's a big shout out over there. We have a rebuttal over here? Power Vice. Uh-oh. Temple Mount. The, the Temple Mount itself, right? Because I think most people say this, right? The the Kosel or the Kosel or the Kota, the Kotel, depends if you're from Missouri or not. Right, to come along and speak out the concept of that this uh, this holy place we go to visit the Kotel, not necessarily stopping to think there's something behind it, right? There's something that, that's so much more that's built up over there. What do we really mourn on Shiva Asavatamas? Do we understand what we lost? Filmed in the heart of Yerushalayim, we take you on a journey of all that can be found. This is Lost and Found. I am an ancient wall of stone atop a hill so high. And if you listen with your heart, you just may hear my cry. You know, when I come out here together with you, Rav Gav, it reminds me of the story of the Rav of Yerushalayim. You know, when he, he came here and they wanted to be Mechabed the Rav. So they said, we're going to give him the best apartment in the entire Jewish quarter. Oh, and it no. was an apartment that was right on the other side of, of Aish. And he had a window overlooking the Kotel. Now, obviously, that's the best real estate, right? That people would pay the... People are asking us, this Happy. is the best real estate, <laughs> right? And it is. It's overlooking the holiest site in the world. And everyone comes out here and they're like, wow, this is so amazing. But you know what the Rav saw every day? He's so weird looking at the largest destruction of the Jewish people. Yeah. That's what we're looking at. We're looking at a destroyed house. We're looking at something that is, that is not the idea. So how do, you, how do you explain that to people? And when and they're like, oh, it's so beautiful, but it's not. It's the Chorba. Listen, the Gemara, we well know the Gemara. The Gemara talks about how at a wedding, there was a rabbi getting married. And uh, at the wedding, as we have the common custom now to break a glass under yeah. the chuppah, the rabbi comes over and starts singing a song to them. Vai lund the misdun, which is very not in the, in the theme that, of a what wedding. What does that mean? What does that Woe mean? is to us for the day of death. Yeah. What are you doing? You're, you're at a wedding. Why would you talk like that? The answer is don't get carried away. It's true, all this is beautiful, but, but really it's, it's more reminiscent of something else. 
we're meant to enjoy our life and, and, and be happy and feel connected. But at the same time, we're disconnected. So when we look at this and we say like, wow, it's so beautiful. But I think most people are looking down. They're looking at the coat. They're looking at the coat. Right? That's they're, what they think is like, like I mean. shifting a little bit up. And then you see like, but we're missing everything. We're missing everything. Welcome to the Old City. I'm Tzvi, Tzvi Sat. I live here in the Old City. I'm originally from New York. And I want to take you behind the scenes to understand Shiva Asabratama is slightly different. A Shiva Asabratama is that we're going to delve in to the actual history. You're going to get to see it, feel it, experience it in a way that you'll never had before. This is very, very exclusive in the sense that most people have never been here. Okay, I'm only allowed in as an employee because I volunteer to dig here and because of the, the craziness that is constantly being uncovered and they're trying to teach us you know, as it goes on. They know that everywhere you turn here, there's insane, insane amount of history beneath the ground. You just have to get there. I think this is the artist rendering of the newest project here in the tunnels. It's a project that is absolutely, absolutely gonna change the way we view the coastal. The coastal of you here is the area above here. This white line is the floor of the coastal. They know that everywhere you turn here, there's insane, insane amount of history beneath the ground. You just have to get there. The problem is we can't stop digging, st start digging in an area where people are davening. It doesn't go, we can't stop davening. But Corona gave us an opportunity to put in the special, special pillars, these special foundation pillars that you see behind me, these huge white pillars, to put them in, in a way without bothering the actual, actual davening, so we can now begin to dig beneath the floor. If you look at my picture here, you're looking at a picture where, of the artist rendering, the dream of the coastal authorities, to actually have a whole nother section back down here uncovering the history of Yerushalayim. I held a lamp, an oil lamp, like they mentioned in all the Mishnayis from the time of the second base of Mikdash, from that time period, never used, brand new. They've discovered it here. We've discovered some of the most magnificent things. It's all being uncovered and hopefully soon we'll open up obviously, obviously to the public. But this is really the next, next wave of Yerushalayim's history. <laughs> The question which everybody should ask and I think does ask is, okay, so Shavos HaBetamuz, Abena Mitzarim, three weeks, and Tisha B'Av, but what are we actually missing? Okay, action. Well, action. What's going on? We have a day in uh, the Jewish calendar known as Shavos HaBetamuz, the 17th day of Tammuz. It's the beginning of the breaching of the walls. And the question is, what does it mean to you personally, these ideas of fast days and, and of 17th of Tammuz in particular? Um, I remember years ago I learned from my rabbi, Shivasar Batamos is the day of the beginning of the end. That many times in life you're going to reach this point in your life where, you know, you think you're at the end and that's when things get scary. That's when you need to turn to Hashem. And there's still a process that unfolds. Shivasar Batamos is, is not the end in itself, but it was the beginning of the end. And I think there's a recognition we're supposed to have on Shiva Sarbatamas of, you know, turn to Hashem before it's too late. Mm. Of, you know, you, you still have time to do tshuva. And I think that was the message of the Nevi'im and of the G'daylim of the time was there's always a chance to turn back to Hashem. I think that message it's not is over. eternal. Exactly. The message is eternal. And what does it mean to fast? It's a day of disconnection for connection. We turn off our phone for Shabbos to elevate. We disconnect from food in order to focus on our tefillos. Now, if it's harder for some people, easier for some people, but Shiva Sarva Thomas is a day of connection to Kaddish Baruch like any other. This is really a place where my grandfather, my father's father was born here before 1948. During the Six Day War, he was on the Chativa Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem Brigade. And he came right after the paratroopers. We have a picture of him at the Kotel in 1967. This was our neighbor. He's still here. And part of his like hobby is to look at the details. I don't know if you could come in. These are old ancient stones that are fr were just ruins. And, and he found them around the old city. So just seeing all of these things, it shows us like what used to be here and, how it, and where we're heading. And we meet Mark and Ellie again. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you guys here yeah, in the streets of Yerushalayim. See you later. Okay. We'll see you later, Mark. Okay, we're going to go up these stairs. And this is really where I grew up as a little kid. So I'm, I'm like, just an, imagine like a 10-year-old boy walking up these stairs, up and down. We used to go down to the Kotel, uh, you know, to Davin Friday night. 
And this, this was my parents, uh, my grandparents' place. This street is called Mamadot Israel. On Shivasar Betamas was the day that Moshe Rabbeinu came down and he saw that they did Chet Egel, so he broke the Luchos. It's the day that the Tamid, the continuity of the carbon Tamid, was lost. It's the day that Apostomus burnt the Sefer Torah and he said, I'm going to destroy the Sefer Torah and there won't be Torah for the Jewish people. And we come back here today in Tav Shin Pei Gimel, 2023, and the Torah is alive. They tried to destroy us. They did destroy. They destroyed the body, the sticks, the stones. Unfortunately, also, many people that died and are still dying today here in Eretz Israel because they're still trying to destroy us. And what kept us together is that connection to Torah. On Shivasar Betamuz is the day where we lost our connection to Torah. I want to share with you an incredible story of how these two Sifrei Torah in front of me, how they went from a small house in the middle of nowhere in Poland and they ended up here in Yerushalayim. For the past many years I've been bringing students to Poland for a powerful educational experience and uh, I have a very special person who I work with there. He somehow found out that in the middle of nowhere there were two Sifrei Torah for sale. and it was in the middle of the winter and we went to this small town where there are for sure no Jews living there. And we went to this apartment building and knocked on the door and walked into a very tiny small apartment and it was filled with Christmas trees and crosses and you know, everything like. And sitting there on the couch were these two Sifrei Torah and they wanted $10,000 for both of them. The compromise we got to was $6,000, but cash, okay? When we got it in, um, we actually made a whole event for it and that there was actually a picture of a Holocaust survivor holding the Sefer Torah, and that picture went viral. It was basically an image of hope. Now the problem is we don't really know the story. Were they, you know, given to neighbors as they were being taken out? You know, and they told the neighbors, hold on to these. Were they sitting in the shul after the whole town was liquidated and now, you know, people went and stole them? Don't know. I was able to find a specialist who deals with old Sifrei Torah. This larger one here, unfortunately, it cannot be restored. There's nothing that can be done with it. The smaller one 
can actually be restored and used. If you look at both of the Sifre Torah, okay, parts in the beginning and the end have been cut out and probably sold. Okay, you can walk into you can walk into a, a, a antique shop in Warsaw. Okay, I've been there before, and you can buy things like this. Okay, you know when the Jewish people leave Mitzrayim. Okay, and they sing after the crossing of the sea. Okay, and you can I I paid five hundred dollars for this. It's worth about that's no, nothing. It's not, nothing you can do with this. So the one that we can fix, actually, the person who I'm working with right now. He actually has a Sefer Torah that's written during the same time. We're going to take parts of that from the beginning and the end. And the goal is that in the near future, this Sefer Torah will be here in Yerushalayim, be used by people. And that's the story. Yeah, and just like, hey, mom. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, question is as follows. I'm, I'm sure you've heard of different uh, dates in Jewish history. Uh -huh. right, one of them is called Shiv Asr B'Tamuz. You've heard of such a thing? Of course. Yeah, heard of it? Mm -hmm. Do you know what happened on Shavasa Batamas? Even one thing that occurred? Is that when they surrounded the wall? Uh, right? That's when they breached. When oh, when they, they breached? Yeah. I thought, uh... I saw it with Tevis saw, was so... they surrounded, right? Oh. And then Shavasa Batamas, they breached the walls. Oh. And then on Tisha B'av is when they, when they finally yeah. destroyed it. So the question is for you. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to judge based off just meeting you for a couple of seconds. That's fine. That you guys grew up, you're familiar with these type of holidays. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you were to give one message to the Jewish people about the idea of Shavas Abatamos, Tisha B'Av, what would you say? Make sure you fast and take it serious. Yeah. yeah. What do you say? If you're trying to like gain something out of it, then like learn the reason. I guess learn the meaning behind it, so you can actually like gather what you're what you're doing. You know, so you can understand why you're doing it. Amazing. Instead of just fasting. Anything you want to say to your mom? Uh, love you, mom. Love you, dad. Hi. <laughs> right, guys, thanks very much. Thank no you. Problem. Have a good day. Have a good one. Uh, have a good You guys want to come in? You guys want to come in? Come join us. Remember that whatever Shem does, I call it Tova. Wow, amazing. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, there, there's a very famous person. He was the founder, the, the starter of Macy's, the famous store, Macy's. His name is Nathan Strauss. Nathan Strauss had taken a bunch of his family members and they traveled to not just Israel, but a bunch of major, major, major uh, countries all around the world. In those days, this was a big deal because they didn't have airplanes, travel was very complicated, and you had to book your tickets for your boats, etc., well, well in advance. It wasn't something you just show up and get on a flight. And he had this big, huge world, tri world trip planned. He gets to Israel. Part of, he's a Jewish guy. He comes to Israel, he wants to see Israel, and Lo and behold, he hurts himself in a way that the doctor tell him he can't travel anymore. And he has a total panic attack. He goes, you don't realize, I, if I miss my boat, I didn't just miss my boat, I missed the boat after that and the boat after that. It's a whole itinerary that's being thrown off. You sure I can't travel? They said, we do not recommend you travel, you gotta stay in Israel. He was really bummed. His family members, they decided to travel. The next stop was to go to England. From England, they're gonna go back to the States. And he doesn't travel. He stays here and he's really upset about it. They missed the boat because he was here and they missed the next boat from England to the US. When the next boat from England to the US was the Titanic, and he realized that by him hurting his leg, he saved his life, he had a very, very awakening of maybe there's a reason I should be here in Israel. And he actually begins and starts a massive, massive philanthropy, philanthropy project to go and to actually help the people of Israel. There's a lot, a lot of things in Israel people don't even realize that are all connected to Nathan Strauss. He built right over here in this building, we call it Beit Strauss because he, he bought this building, a food bank, like a, a place where four poor people could come and could get food. This operated for many years when Jerusalem was the poorest of the poor. Welcome to the tunnels. This is one of the most amazing, amazing experiences of actually seeing Yerushalayim's history in front of you standing in a corridor that was discovered and they noticed right in the beginning that on the, alongside each part of, the, of this corridor is an arch. You guys see this arch over here? If you spin around this way, you'll see how there's another arch right over adjacent to it, to the left of it, right over here. And, and there's continuing multiple that way, multiple arches, and a few more that way. And they're very confused by these arches. What purpose do they serve? Moving over here, we basically found these arches of what we call the bridge. The bridge sounds very, very vague. Let me show you what that is. Follow me for a second. The Hashmonayim 
were here and they were metahir the base of Mikdash. The base of Mikdash was taken over by the Yavanim and it was made into a place of Tumah. They had an idol in the base of Mikdash. And most of Am Yisrael was living in Bavel at that time. They said, why should we come? It's not a place for us. Why should we come to Eretz Yisrael? Why should we come to the base of Mikdash? And the Chashmonai fought that. And they were metahir the Tamayim. They were able to make the base of Mikdash tar again. They were, the story of Hanukkah is one little part of that picture where they found the tar oil, the pure oil. But at the end of the day, the Chashmonai brought people back to Eretz Yisrael. They brought people back to the base of Mikdash. And they also made the base of Mikdash more accessible. Just to overly simplify it, I'm not going to get into details over here, but see this bridge here? This bridge was built originally by the Chashmonai. The Chashmonai were 2,300 years ago. It's actually older than the coastal because the coastal was only built toward the end of the second base of Mikdash. And this bridge is exactly what's behind me. This arch is the arches of the bridge. See how they have those arches? sometimes double layer arches. Okay, you can see over here, there's like two layers. We bit discovered the original bridge. It's one of the oldest finds we have in this area. But the craziest thing is we said, wait a second, we're not gonna stop by just discovering the upper layer. Let's dig out the lower layer. I wanna show you that, come on, follow me. We're gonna see the lower because the lower you go in history, the, I'm saying depth wise, the older, which means we're gonna go more and more and more ancient times. Who was here? The coastal is a big open area surrounded by a lot of residential homes. Many of those homes, particularly ones to the left, or upper left, are actually built on top of the coastal, blocking the coastal. The coastal tunnel tours is an archaeological dig that is found beneath those homes. And most of the coastal today is unaccess inaccessible to us unless you go into the tunnels. What happens is when we discovered the bridge, well, let me show you where it is in, in proximity to the coastal as you know it. If you see over here, okay, you'll see right there is the bridge. The bridge that is Entering Harabais, which is behind it, behind the coast cell, that bridge was a, the, a major, major access point built by the Hashemunayim. Let me show you a little more of how it looked in, in reference to the coast cell. If you look over here, you see the coast cell as it is today. We extended the wall because the wall really exists behind it, just today covered by those homes. And we show you how there was a known entrance to Harabais that this bridge served, allowing Ola Regal or any other people who want to come to the base of Mikdash into Harabais. Every single person, man, woman, and child, who came to the base of Mikdash, even if they had gone to the Mikvah two hours before outside of Yerushalayim, that when they showed up in Yerushalayim, before they went up to Harabais, they had to go to the Mikvah. And therefore, we find today over 180 mikvos surrounding our bias. It's not a chiddush. It's not something unique or special because we know that would have happened. We know there's no way that all those millions of people who came to visit the base of Mikdash would not have gone to the mikvos. So therefore, you must have a lot of mikvos. But we find a very unique one here. Uh, as we get further in the Torah, we're going to understand a little more the why it's unique. But if you look down here, you'll see steps. These steps on the left side, you can see there's covered. There's a plaster layer. Plaster is used for waterproofing. Any mikvah had to have plaster or the water were to seep out and steps going into this underground water retaining room means a mikvah. This is a mikvah. This mikvah is from the second base of mikdash. People who were going up the base of mikdash went into this actual mikvah. Every single person, as we said earlier, who went to the base of mikdash first went to the mikvah. We find tons of mikvahs and each one looks primarily like a mikvah that we see today. It has three walls and steps going inside it. Over here in the tunnels, we find a mikvah that totally doesn't fit that description. It's a mikvah that has three sides, all four sides, sorry, are stepped. There's steps on all four sides and it's also extremely, extremely shallow. And that was very, very confusing to the experts who were digging this. They said, why is this mikvah different? And right away, they all can't try thinking of what is there, what other types of mikvahs or what other uses does mikvah have that we would maybe begin to understand why this mikvah is different than other mikvahs we find over here. And the first, the most common explanation is based on a Gemara and based on a Mishnah. The Mishnah describes in, in, mikvah, in mikvahs that the way they were tovel the machat, the, the, it's, it's a form of a keli, of a vessel, but it was a needle. The way they were tovel, they were put on the steps of the mikvah and the water would rise up and cover the machat and that's how they were tovel, that's how they immersed the kalim. It was a kalim mikvah. Okay, and they said, wait a second, this makes more sense. It's very, very wide, very, very shallow. It might have been a great kalim mikvah. Another proof they have to that theory is that we, the Gemara mentions that after a Lila Regal, people who just go up three times a year to the base of Mikdash, oh, they were very, very nervous that things had become tame throughout the, the craziness of the Chagim. And therefore, they to, would take oh, most of the kalim out of the base of Mikdash and immerse it in, in mikvahs afterwards to make sure it would become tar again. And they said that they needed these big mikvahs that weren't so deep to lay out the, the kalim. And the most common explanation of this mikvah is that it was a kalim mikvah. The problem is, is that we do have a little bit of a debate 
Kuwana, another great archaeologist here that is very, very involved. He's a big expert on mikvah. And he says that the idea of kalim mikvos is something that we consider a new, a new idea. It used to be in the old, old times, they took, they took the regular regular mikvos were used also for kalim. And he says the Mishnah and the Gemara don't seem to imply a kalim only mikvah, they just seem to imply a regular mikvah. And so he leaves this as a regular mikvah. But I, as personally, my own understanding, I may be wrong, but I find that there's a specific uniqueness to this mikvah. I don't believe it's a kalim mikvah, I believe it's a children's mikvah. The same way on the short end of a pool is where the children use the shallow, right, and they have steps to go in, and the deep you have, like you could just jump in, you don't really have steps. I believe the fact that they had a narrow pool here with a lot of steps is because even children had to go to the mikvah before going to the base of mikdash, and therefore maybe this was a special mikvah for them so they could have a safe way to access the base of mikdash, the tahara, purity. You be wondering that behind this mikvah we mentioned earlier is a big white wall. This is a modern wall, this is not ancient. Unfortunately, we can't access it today because it's being reinforced and prepared for opening to the public. But they found a mikvah from the second base of mikdash, 2,000 years old, that in the process of preparing it and uncovering it, they had to d d drill a hole through the wall to verify that the wall was safe and secure in a place where people could actually come visit. And when they drilled through the wall by accident, totally accidentally, they actually nailed right into what's called an aquifer. An aquifer is like an ancient underground water source that just naturally runs and it filled up the mikvah and this and it's a totally halakhically kosher for source of water for a mikvah so you actually now have a 2000 year old mikvah that is full and as a kosher mikvah it's the oldest kosher mikvah in the world in theory it's not very clean and in theory you could actually go into it and use it in total today Yaf yaf isa mi bine mi bine ada mo tzaku tzake b'sif sai secha b'sif sai secha yaf yaf isa yaf yaf isa mi bine mi bine ada mo tzaku The question is that Shivasa uh, Batamus. We know that the, the walls are breached and I mean, you're seeing what's going on over here. There would be like some sort of message you would want to send to Cloud Israel about these days, what we should be thinking about and what we should be doing, what would it be? <laughs> Straight to the point. <laughs> Daily giving is the Jewish people's collective tzedakah box. Every day we give one dollar and together those dollars are pooled in order to make a huge impact Every single individual gives half a shekel, the rich and the poor, because everyone together is a part in making the change. A contribution to Daily Giving is also in support of Camp Hask, providing support and services for hundreds of individuals with specialized needs and their families during the summer and throughout the year. For a dollar a day, you can take part in the magic here too. This is equipment that is crucial for saving lives. We wouldn't have had this without support through Daily Giving. When you sign up for Daily Giving, you're not just helping one organization, you're helping over 75 different incredible Jewish nonprofits. And we've already distributed over $10 million. We're now giving out over $5 million a year. To give a dollar a day, it's not asking too much. And if you can do it, we'll be able to give this. Today, what can you get for a dollar? But when you put all of our dollars together, all of a sudden the dollar becomes huge. So that is your life hack. Go check it online right now. Look at the calendar and you will see every dollar that's given goes directly to another organization. How do you get the biggest bang out of your buck, out of your dollar? It's called dailygiving.org. Let's go meet Ellie Beer. How's it going, Ellie? Hey, how are you, Yoni? Good, good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. How are you feeling? Baruch Hashem. Welcome, welcome. Shiva Sarvatama started really all the tragedies of Israel. 
Sinas Chinam. This is where it's all coming from. And I live in Yerushalayim my whole life. And I've seen the building of Yerushalayim, but i also seen, unfortunately, also Machoikas. And I think what I do here in United Hatzala is uniting people together. Not only in Yerushalayim, but all over Eretz Yisrael. People who have nothing to do with each other. Sephardic, Ashkenazi, Haredi, ultra Haredi, and less Haredi, secular. Everyone together in one mission. Saving lives. Saving lives is the essence of Ahavas Chinam. And this is what's going to bring Mashiach, in my opinion. The beginning of B.S. Mashiach is today, uniting to save other people's lives. I am Leah Farkash. I work 40 years for Yad Ezra, the Push Your Friends organization. The Push Your Friends taught us the essence of life is chesed. The essence of life is taking care of people who are going through a hard time. In any way, in any way you can imagine. They, they are <laughs> widows, they are poor ladies who have a difficult life. They come here and they have community, they have warmth. We give to them tools in life, tools that they feel good, tools that they are happy and to get them back on their feet. Okay, here we are in the department of digitalization from the rabbinate, the Israeli rabbinate, the Rabbanu Tarashit. People were working here, on very old papers, that people wanted to get married, right? To Dat Ravakut, in order to prove that a person is single and not married before he wanted to go to the chupa. So one day, this lady over here, she found the proof of Reb Chaim Kanievsky. When he was still single, before he wanted to get married, he went to the rabbinate, to the rabbanut. And so he had to come up with the proof that he is single and we found the original paper over here. In the times of, uh, before the, sec the, the 67 war, this was close to the border. Actually, the prices in Jerusalem were very cheap. Now it became like the center of Jewish life. The, it's close to the Mir Yeshiva that everybody knows. It's close to many other Yeshivas where people come and learn and in the streets are many people. So when a sick person, a mentally sick person is coming to his daily job, he immediately goes into the crowd and enjoys the, the liveliness of the streets, which is extremely important. So. Um, the pusher established the, the rehabilitation center over here. But there's no sign. You will not see a sign. We are Yad Ezra and we are doing all kinds of things of chesed. Why? Because it's written by the Rambam, the Maimonides, that the broche, the blessing is everywhere what is hidden from the eye. So that is actually the whole motto, the whole idea of the pusher's establishment. Everything we do, we do in its niyut. We don't need to put huge posters. We are doing chesed and we are giving out uh, food for the poor and we are doing rehabilitation for the sick. Everything is anonymous. Everything is niyut because there is the broche. And for the 40 years that I'm connected to Reb Freund, I can tell you there's a tremendous broche in this whole idea, in this whole derech of chesed because that is the way to physical health and to mental health and to a really great connection to Hashem and the real Emes Dike Avodat Hashem. Maybe that's the way to Gu'ula also. When I had my second daughter, my house burned down. It was actually Erev Pesach. I always say we had Biur Hamed Flame Adrin. That year, I actually knew what destruction was. You know, I was singing on Pesach, and I, I felt it. I felt what it means to 
be lost. When the Beit HaMikdash was around, we all had a sense of purpose. We all knew what, was, what we were supposed to be doing. And the second the temple was destroyed, that's what we all felt. We all felt a communal sense of loss, a communal sense of where do we go from here? What are we going to do? When we are at these periods of difficulty and tragedy, that we realize, why do we have to have tragedy in order to unite us? Why do we have to have difficulty in order to realize who we are? What makes me proud of being Jewish is to know that we're one, is to know that we all care for each other, you know, is to know that it doesn't matter what's going to happen, we're going to pull us through, through any challenge that we have. And at any moment in my life that I feel like I'm going to give up and that I'm not going to make it, I realize maybe I'm not going to make it. But the Jewish people are going to make it for me. And the Jewish people are going to bring me out. And that's a bit of everything, you know. So thank you, Meaningful Minot, for, you know, building us and uniting us. And I'm sitting here in uh, Neve Yerushalayim, and the description of Neve Yerushalayim is we're home. And a home is where we all care for each other because we understand that when you're doing well, I'm doing well. And it's time to start feeling for one another, to step out and to see what are you doing? How are you doing? What can I do for you? So maybe we be there for each other and may Hashem give us the opportunity to rebuild the temple. First of all, the temples in our hearts that we should really welcome God to live with us, that we should make it a safe place, a welcome place in which we accept God, we accept ourselves in our relationship with God so that then we can embrace everyone else and that we can welcome all of the Jewish people no matter how they look like, no matter who they are, because you know, at the end of the day, not every finger of your hands looks exactly the same way. And you know, that's the beauty of a family. The beauty of a family is diversity. So may we all welcome, and may we just see a lot of simcha in the Jewish people. And Bezrat uh, Hashem. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Mayor Grumberg, live from the beautiful city of Jerusalem in the more beautiful neighborhood of Nachlaot. We're here to talk about what Jerusalem means to me on a personal level. I moved here a little over a year ago. I grew up near Miami in Hollywood, Florida. I was born in Venezuela. This crazy Jewish story of going all over the world but ending up here. There was a very special moment last year on Tisha B'Av where it actually landed on Shabbat. So on the 9th of Av, we were celebrating Shabbat, we were eating, we were drinking, we weren't mourning, we weren't sitting down on the floor, we weren't crying, we weren't reading Kinot. We were celebrating and, you know, our sages tell us that Tisha B'Av is supposed to be a day like that, it's supposed to be a happy day where everything flips, where that's the day that Mashiach was born and he's going to come. So it really felt like the energy was so potent that it literally, we always say Mashiach now, it could, it could literally have happened in any moment on that Shabbat. So, you know, when I think about uh, what Jerusalem means to me, I really think about that Shabbat. It also happened to be one of the first Shabbats that I hosted a meal at my house at, for Friday night. So it was like a unique moment where all these different things were coming together in on an individual level, on a national level. And it could only happen here. You can't have that in Miami. You can't have that in Venezuela. <laughs> you ready? You ready, my friend? Are you ready? For what? Okay. Shalom Aleichem. You're, you're about to help a lot of Jews. Okay. We're not talking about Tchilis yet. Okay. <laughs> oh, but we can throw that in also. You okay. ready? Yeah, sure. Okay. The question is, are you familiar with Jewish holidays? Uh, yeah, from when I'm a little boy. Okay. Uh, you ready for this one? Let's try. Name me a tragic day in Jewish history. Shiva Sabatamuz. Whoa. What message would you tell Jewish world about Shiva Um To be to be a, a part of the story of Am Yisrael, to, to, to be sad when the, when the times that are sad, and to be happy in the times that are happy, and and just to realize the giant miracle that we that we we see in front of our eyes that this nation went through all these three thousand something years, and uh, and what great things the Navim are promising us that are um, uh, so, so close. Bezat Hashem. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Amazing, <laughs> amazing. <laughs>
Hi, I'm Nina Broder, also known as the Jerusalemite. Um, I was born in Yerushalayim and love living here. It's my city. So people always used to ask me how come I loved going to the Kotel so much and what my connection was. Because some people have a hard time praying here and with all the noise and the distraction and the people. And during COVID, for the first time, I was able to explain to people that just like how you had a barrier between you and your loved ones, like a window or a wall, for example, the Kotel is that for me with Harabai or Beit HaMikdash in the future, please God. Um, it's as close as I can physically get to it. It's instead of just talking far away on the phone or not really seeing it physically, I'm close and I'm able to feel the holiness and it's just where I want to be and how I connect to Hashem and to Judaism and pray as hard as I can. Behind me is a beautiful, beautiful model of the second base of Mikdash, the last phase, the one that Herod built. See a white building, it's sort of like a tower, it's taller. That is the Holy of, Sol Holy of Holies, the Kodesh HaKadosh. That's the spot where the Kohen Gadol, one day a year, when on Yom Kippur, went in to do a special, special tefillah that was asked for tshuva from the entire world. It was the main, today on Yom Kippur, we try to mimic that in our own tefillahs. But he did it for us in those days. That's why it's such a major deal. Inside the Kodesh HaKadosh was the original stone of Har Moriah. Har Moriah was a mountain that Akidas Yitzhak happened. The Gemara says the world was created at the peak of Har Moriah. Yaakovino's dream, according to Rashi, with the, with the ladder of the, of the Malachim going up and down, that old, that, the peak of that mountain comes up right inside the Kodesh HaKadoshim. If you look at here what's lit up now primarily, that is what we call the base HaMikdash. And then there was the third wall, which is the outer wall of Harabais, we call the western wall. And only a small section that we today consider like the western wall over here is open for davening. Medrash says that La lo zaza shechina man koslam aravi. The shechina, Hashem's presence in this world, will never leave the Western Wall. And this is one of the reasons why specifically the Western Wall we dive in at, and not anywhere else. So if you see over here, you can see on the model, we have a plus shape building. A building that we discovered beneath the ground. Right over here, we actually have a coastal that's been hidden for 600 plus years. And thank God for the tunnels we get to see that. See, these are massive, beautiful stones put into place by Herod. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And this coastal is the rooftop above me is the floor of the outside section. That the coastal goes about another two stories beneath me. We're standing here in a beautiful, beautiful shul built inside the tunnels. There was one spot of the tunnels that allowed, allowed a really, really big open area. The shul is, is amazing. First reason, this is the coastal that was hidden for 600 years and now is uncovered. And now you get to sit in padded seats with air conditioning and actually be by the coastal. It's absolutely, absolutely spectacular. This room, this shul also has a Aron Kodesh in the shape of a remote. Right? We have the 613 mitzvahs connected to the Rimon, the, the pits of the Rimon. This is a handmade, it has a Shema Yishol on the front door, Shira Shirim around the side, Ana Bekoach under it, an absolutely, absolutely gorgeous Aron Kodesh here inside the tunnels opposite the Kosal. But one of my favorite parts in addition to that is if you look downwards, you'll see a beautiful floor, a floor that's made out of onyx. 
Onyx is mentioned a ton in the Torah. We call it Avnei Shoham. Avnei Shoham was the two stones over here on the on the Choshen, okay, of the Kohen Gadol. And the Gemara, according to one of the opinions of the Gemara, Avnei Shoham will be the floor of the third base of Mikdash. Avnei Shoham Onyx is a naturally translucent stone, which means light goes through it, and most of the light in the Shul is actually from the floor. And they actually light up the room through this beautiful, beautiful stone. It's extraordinarily expensive, and this really gives it the beautiful, beautiful uh, design that they have in here. But in addition to that, this is not just a show of how nice we can make a shul. We know that a shul is called a mikdash me'at, a small base of mikdash. Now, imagine how beautiful this one is. Imagine how much more beautiful the real one will be. What does it mean to you, Shavas Vatamos, personally? So I, I don't think it meant much until I just started living in the old city for the first time. Wow. And I think that once you live here, once you actually feel the, the Kedusha of the old city, not just Yushalayim or Israel, but really the old city, and really being here, you can feel what it would be like to be under siege, right? And to not be able to get out and almost have this anticipation and this scared feeling that I'm locked and trapped in here for the rest of my life until I almost die. So you growing up in the United States, I guess, uh, you've heard of it, you, you, you would fast, and but it wouldn't necessarily be something so meaningful, I take it. Yeah, I, I, I think a lot of holidays um, are harder to connect when you're not in Israel, especially fast days, uh, Tisha B'Av, Shabbat 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 right? among others. And I think that once you're here, once you're really living here, and you feel the Kedusha, the walls, just being around everything, uh, you're able to touch it a little bit more than I think you are anywhere else in the world. And that's what I think is so special about Israel. So what would you say to somebody not living in Israel, even living in Israel, Bet Shavas and Thomas, what message would you give over? I think it's about finding the little things that we can in our lives. So if that's something that we can take that's very small, and we can repair that. We feel ourselves doing something wrong a little bit. Some, some little thing that we can change to feel like our walls have been breached for a little bit to make sure that we can continue to grow stronger and to be better for the future of Klai Yisrael. Wow, thank you very much. Thank you, great. And what would you say if you can give some sort of message to the Jewish people around the world about Shiva Sabat Tammuz, what would you say? To remember that the one, on one hand to be sad, but on the other hand to be, to be happy that today we can at least go and visit Jerusalem. And I would call everyone to come and move here and to help build the country. You heard it here, folks. Come on down. You've been invited. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Ilana Twig. I am here in Moshav Azaria in the center of Israel. Um, this is our farm, part of our farm. Uh, Nepala and Nico are right behind me. Uh, I was born in the United States, uh, in Boston, Massachusetts, made Aliyah as a little girl, uh, made Yerida to Ottawa, Canada when I was a young teen and came back to Israel on my own. I always felt a very deep connection to Israel. Uh, when I, was in, I came back as a lone soldier, did my uh, army service, and that's where I met Doron, my husband. Doron is a third generation farmer in Israel. Um, his parents were farmers here. His grandparents who came from Iraq and Tunisia were farmers. The farm that we live on today was his grandparents' house. And we are continuing the family tradition and we feel very, uh, very fortunate, very blessed to be farmers in Israel. And we also feel very special and fortunate that as Jewish farmers in Israel, we get to keep the mitzvot atluyot ba'aretz, um, which is something that has we have been keeping in the family for generations. Um, what are mitzvot leket, pe'ah, shichicha, orla. In English? 
Oh, the mitzvot are not required. The laws, the mitzvot uh, that are only required to be kept in Israel. Um, so many of them have to do with agriculture. Uh, leket, pea, shechecha, orla, trumotu masrot. Uh, these are mitzvahs that we do on a regular basis, even today. Um, uh, so many people have asked, so if you leave pea on the field, do people actually come and collect the wheat? Uh, so usually not the wheat. The fruits and the vegetables, yes, uh, but occasionally we do see teachers, etc., that come and take uh, wheat from the fields. Um, one mitzvah that we didn't keep kehil uh, chata for all those generations was shmita. Um, the mitzvah that every seventh year the land rests. The land rests, the worker of the land rests, everything uh, no longer belongs to the farmer, it belongs to Hashem, anyone can come and take, everything is hefker. Um, Whenever a Shemitah year would come, a few months before Shemitah started, a representative of the Rabbanut would come by and we would sign a document uh, doing something called Heter Mechira, which is I, it complicated, uh, but essentially was a heter that was given um, in the 1880s uh, to allow the farmers to continue working their land um, so they don't have to stop for the year, which is essentially more than a year, lose money, um, risk losing the land. Um, and this heter that was given as a temporary heter, essentially, has continued for, you know, 150 years later, we're still doing it, uh, until last Shemitah, eight, nine years ago, uh, when we started thinking about doing Shemitah Ki Yichata. And on Erev Rosh Hashanah of the sixth year, I turned to my husband, I said, in a year, it's Shemitah, you have 365 days to get ready. Um, let's do it, let's do Shemitah Ki Yichata. And I was just thinking, we were private people doing a private mitzvah. I wanted him to rest, I wanted the land to rest. I just, it, it, was, it was almost selfish, my, my incentive. Um, and he continued working as usual. About a month before Shemitah started, he was out in our fields and he ran into a couple of yeshiva bachers from Bnei Brak. And they immediately, they, they came, they wanted to collect uh, the leket, the olelot, which is the leket that we have in the, um, in the grapes. He, they wanted to make wine for the seventh year from the fruit of the sixth year and they immediately asked him, you know, it's almost Shemitah, are you going to be keeping Shemitah ki chata? And he said, well, we've been thinking about it, we've been talking about it, but I don't see how we can do it. We had huge contracts with Sabra Salads at the time and we had just built some greenhouses at a great expense. Um, and the first guy said, no, so for a year you won't make a profit. Do you always make a profit farming? And my husband said, no, but shutting down a business for a year is a different story. Um, the second guy said to him, you know, for 2,000 years, the Jews waited in the Galut to keep the, these mitzvot atluyot ba'aretz. And here you are, a Jewish Israeli farmer, you have this mitzvah under your hand, and you're just going to let it go? And that's, well, if you speak to my husband, who doesn't speak English, uh, he would describe feeling a huge weight on his shoulders, uh, feeling responsibility. He, he said, I'm looking at these guys who are more makbid than we are in so many mitzvot and study all day long, but this is our mitzvah. This is the farmer's mitzvah. It, a huge feeling of kol uh, Israel arivim zelazel, mutual responsibility. Uh, and in the same way that we can grow eggplants for a million people who can't grow their own eggplant, we can keep shmitah for a million people who can't keep shmitah. The connection, the 2,000 years, the understanding, which we now have learned so much more since, uh, of the connection between Churban Beit HaMikdash and the Galut and how complex this mitzvah of Shemitah is, which is not keeping Shemitah was one of the reasons that Israel uh, was sent to, to Galut. Um, it all sort of came together for him that moment and he decided that we were going to do Shemitah Ki Yilchata. Um, but with a little uh, asterisk that we were going to do Shemitah Ki Yilchata in about 400 dunam of open fields that we had, but we were going to do heter mechira in 10 dunam of greenhouses that we had, that we were growing eggplants for a huge company. We had a contract that we were obligated to, and we had loans that we had to pay back. And we said, he said, we're going to do heter mechira there. Um, ordered 20,000 eggplant plants, planted um, those plants. They were supposed to arrive before Rosh Hashanah. They arrived between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. They were planted essentially in the Shemitah year. 
Again, we thought we were private people, but suddenly Karen Ashvi showed up. They heard that we were thinking of keeping Shemitah, and they wanted to let us know that they're there to help support us emotionally, spiritually, uh, financially. Um, and Doron told them, yes, this is what we're going to be doing, a lot of Heter Mechira, and a lot of Shemitah Kil Chata, but a little bit of Heter Mechira. And they said, well, if you want our help, you have to make a decision. Either you're keeping Shemitah or you're not keeping Shemitah. Um, very difficult uh, few minutes. Um, I'm not going to give you the whole story, but we decided that we we're going to be keeping Shemitah Kil Chata. Um, and then immediately the question is raised, um, what do we do with 20,000 eggplant plants that were planted in the Shemitah year? Uh, and the rabbis said, well, they were just planted, they were less than a week old, shut off the water, the greenhouses are 40 degrees Celsius, the plants will die within a few days, shut off the water, and the plants didn't die. And they kept, um, a week went by, two weeks went by, three weeks went by, the plants that started about two or three inches high were now about two or three feet high, and there were already flowers, which means they'll soon be eggplants. Um, and we knew this was problematic because this isn't hefker. This is something that was planted in the Shemitah year. Um, again, we contacted the rabbis. What do we do? Um, and they sent a um, delegation of, uh, of uh, Rabbeim through uh, Rabbi Frati's uh, Beit Midrash in Yerushalayim. Uh, and after a conversation, a deliberation, a little bit Yiddish, a little bit of Aramaic, a little bit of Hebrew, it was decided that we need to destroy the crop. Um, they suggested we uproot each plant, which is a huge amount of, uh, of work. And what Doron decided to do was take um, poison that we usually keep to, we use to um, sterilize the soil between uh, um, plots. Uh, we run it through the irrigation system and within a few hours it evaporates and turns into gas and everything in the greenhouse was dead. Um, and that was our start of Shemitah. Uh, in hindsight, we view it as a nisayon that we had to go through, um, something that was extremely difficult, um, both financially, because it's a field that we had already prepared and watered and irrigated and um, uh, tilled and, and uh, fertilized, etc., uh, but also emotionally. You're going against everything that you, um, everything that you do, uh, you, you, you take care of the house, you take care of your children, you take care of your plants, and here we are poisoning them. And there was something um, extra painful about the fact that this was, uh, Doron always describes it as, you know, these plants are so thirsty, they're expecting water after a month that they haven't been watered, and they're getting gas. They think they're getting, a, they're getting water and they're getting gas. And just the whole association was horrific. Um, again, Sometimes you need some, uh, some space to understand uh, things that happen to you. In hindsight, we, I, I believe that it was an Isayon that we had to go through because sh keeping Shemitah is so challenging uh, that it was sort of like, if you can make it through this, you'll be able to make it through the year. A couple of months after Shemitah started, there was a knock at the door and a Haredi gentleman came. My husband opened the door. He said to him, are you Doron the farmer? Doron said yes. Uh, and he said, I want you to give me a bracha. And Doron said a bracha, he looked at him, you know, look, looked at himself, who looks a little bit like me, and looked at this uh, Haredi gentleman with the hat and the suit, and he said, maybe you'll give me a bracha. He said, no, he was very serious, and he took a, a, a letter out of his uh, pocket uh, from Reb Chaim Kanievsky, Zechert Tzadik Levracha, this was uh, eight years ago. Um, and in the letter it said that on the year of Shemitah, if you want a bracha, you should go find a Yehudi Shomer Shemitah. Uh, and Doron, you know, fumbled, gave him a bracha, has this, since then give given tens of thousands of brachot, I think, uh, all around the world. At some point, a school of girls, fourth grade girls from Kiryat Sefer, near Modin, Modin Elite, uh, came. Uh, their teachers weren't, uh, two teachers weren't with them, but the girls asked for a bracha. Um, one teacher hadn't had ch children in 15 years. One had a seven-year-old, but hadn't had any more children since, and they asked for a bracha for children, um, uh, which we gave over the Shabbat candles. and. We found out that nine and a half months later, they both had a bris on the same Shabbos. Uh, one had twins, one had a, a baby boy, and has since had another child. Um, so many stories uh, of brachot, of, not Gashmi brachot, of brachot brachot uh, that we saw through Shemitah. Um, something very, very uh, amazing about this, uh, this uh, mitzvah. Hi, my name is Nava Fulman from Neshe, Neshe Karen Oshvias, 
and I represent the organization that has helped the farmers to keep the mitzvah of Shemitah. You may ask yourself, what does Shemitah have to do with Choban Beit HaMikdash? What does now, today, keeping the mitzvot that we have to keep in Eretz Yisrael have to do with the Chorban that happened so many years ago? Well, the answer is, is that during the first base of Migdash, when Am Yisrael did not keep Shemitah the way they needed to, the entire nation went into Golis for 70 years. 70 years because we didn't keep the mitzvot of the land that Hashem gave us. Ilana is one of our farmers who has decided to keep this mitzvah, a mitzvah that only she can keep as much as I want, I can't keep Shemitah because I'm not a farmer. It's not my work. It's not what I do, but she can. And because she keeps Shemitah for me, for you, because you can't keep it and I can't keep it, but she can, she gives us the right and the ability to stay in this land. She allows us to live in a land that's protected, not only for security, but also by Hashem and by the special mitzvot that she keeps us. We know that the brachot, that Arav Kanievsky told the farmers to give to the people of Am Yisrael, to the nation of Am Yisrael, where hundreds, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of Jews came and begged our farmers for the smallest brachos to the biggest brachos and the unbelievable, amazing Yeshuas that we saw women that hadn't had children in 16 years. How is this possible? How is it possible that Alana can give a bracha to someone who's Haredi, Hasidish, anything, take whatever you want. How is it that she could give a bracha and Hashem say, you gave the bracha, I have to listen. Because when you're most nefesh for Hashem, when you're willing to keep a mitzvah that is impossible, asking someone not to work, to still have debt, to still have to watch the lamb but not be able to touch it. Taking something that you love and not being able to touch it only because Hashem said so. And because of that, Hashem gave them the ability to be the Levim and the Kohanim of this generation that when they give a bracha, it sticks. I have seen bracha in my life because I connected to myself, to Alana and to all the other farmers. And when we come together as one nation, if you look like me, if you look like her, if you look like anybody. Hashem wants His children to love each other. He doesn't care what they look like. He doesn't care what they do. He wants them to love each other because we're all His children. And when I can support her keeping this mitzvah in this land, and she in return can be most or nefesh to keep that mitzvah and give me a bracha, then we're going to see the Beis HaMikdash built again. <laughs> My One message about the base of Mikdash. Okay. It should come right now. Hashem is everywhere equally. He's no more here than He is there. But here He reveals Himself more. And the Temple Mount, when the Temple comes, He's going to reveal Himself again. Even more, like it used to be, even better. But Hashem is with you wherever you are. But the problem is He hides. He hides because He wants us to direct your heart to Heaven. The easiest, best way to direct your heart to Heaven is to remember God is everywhere, right there on your lips. If you go through your day and you sweetly, lovingly speak to God, Hashem, we have to catch the bus. Which way should I go? Soon you become aware of His presence. That's what Hashem wants us to do. How do you miss something that you've never, ever known? If you've ever had the ability to come to the Kotel, you might have put your hand on the Kotel, felt the smooth stone, and felt for a moment just that little bit of tactile inspiration. That's one one hundredth of what you would have felt if the Beis Mikdash was here. You see, the Beis Mikdash, there was a sound. It was full of music. It was full of music. The sound reverberated off the walls. The singing of the Levi'im, the sounds of the trumpet, the sounds of the voices, the sounds of prayer reverberated off the walls. 
And when we would have looked at the base of Nikdash, we would have been inspired. There would have been bright light reflecting. We would have seen, seen all around us this experience of the divine. Not something we had to like work our minds into or learn about, but literally seen it, felt it, heard it. And our base of Mikdash, going there, it would have had this incredible smell. It would have had a smell of incense. It would have had a smell of this incredible perfume, which was meant to open your eyes and, and be inspirational just by smelling it. This isn't forever. We know that just like the base of Mikdash lies in ruins, but one day will be rebuilt. One day, this will be over. The temple will be rebuilt. The base of Mikdash will be back and we will be able to hear and see and smell and feel and taste this experience of the divine again. And the amazing thing is it can happen any moment. Any moment. We say whoever mourns the base of Mikdash will merit to see it rebuilt. As we mourn, as we get real with what we're missing and what we've never experienced, but oh my gosh, how amazing does it sound? How much do I wish that was there? We also get closer and closer to the moment where anyone who's watching this, who has lost someone, you will soon be comforted. Comforted by having them back. This pain and this longing and this missing is only temporary. So let's feel that. Let's feel that deep inside through our senses. And hopefully in the merit that we mourn it, we will merit to see it rebuilt. See you.